So um, first of all, I'd like to begin by saying um, thank you very much to Professor Massimo Latore for the invitation, and thank you very much for the University of um, Tallinn for um, hospitality and um, welcome. Um, and um, I should begin by saying that the title of my paper is uh, Beyond Staatsvissenschaft, the Conception of State and Rights in Kelsen and Weber. So in contrast to um, the first presentation, this is, uh, if you like, the hist a kind of historical backward glance. So um, the tradition of Staatswissenschaft is a, a general theory of the character and organisation of the state uh, as a distinctive phenomenon, both in its concern with a method of theory construction, which founds itself on the scientificity, that is the assertion of the comparable degree of objectivity of its theoretical framework with the natural sciences, and in its emergence as an almost exclusive concern within German-speaking lands. Its emergence and formal recognition uh, in the 19th century is to be understood as a theoretical response to the French Revolution and to the particular trajectory of state formation in uh, German unification as a constitutional monarchy and to a lesser extent in the continued operation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So within this tradition, there is a specific conceptualization of law which is represented by two main thinkers, uh, Paul Laband and uh, George uh, Jelinek. Central difference between Laband and Jelinek is uh, contained in uh, Jelinek's short work of 1895 entitled The Declaration of Man and so the Rights of Man and the Citizen. The importance of this work is that it actively reinterprets the historical origin of the emergence of rights. Uh, in order to integrate them within the framework of this, let's say, broader theory as a theory of Stasrek Lehrer. Now, uh, to go back to the, let's say, title of the, the conference, um, in terms of the Nietzschean notion of a cold monster in the new idol section of Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, we have something uh, uh, different here. Um, which is that in contrast to Nietzsche's, uh, uh, how do you say, opposition between a mendacious substitution by the state um, of itself for the people, um, this tradition of Staatswissenschaft uh, or Staatsklärer um, uh, uh, emphasizes, um, let's say, the position of the monarchy. So it's a type of uh, theory of constitutional monarchy. Now, this theory is definitively brought to an end, uh, at least in German-speaking lands, by um, the First World War. And this is where one can argue that Hans Kelsen and Max Weber make an appearance, uh, because both of them, in their different ways, are uh, uh, part of the formulation of the constitutions of the Austrian First Republic, and in Weber's case, that's Kelsen, and um, in Weber's case, the uh, Weimar um, Constitution, the Weimar Republic. Now, um, Kelsen and Weber are distinguished by the manner in which uh, they criticise and develop their theories in relation to this preceding uh, German language theory. So if we begin with Kelsen, as a theory of uh, the legal science of positive law, it is developed from a direct critique of this preceding tradition. And one of its central um, purposes is to displace the primacy of the state with the primacy of law. And in this way, to do, to, if you like, to juridify the state. Now, this is initially uh, articulated in Kelsen's work of 1911, and then is further modified and extended and arguably concludes, uh, at least first part of Kelsen's, let's say, academic project, with the pure theory of 1934. Now, um, juridification as a Kelsenian concept is the dissolution of the state as an entity which exists prior to law. And juridification is the counterpart of a demonstration that all attempts to situate the state as prior to law 
are a form of hypostatization. In other words, it is to treat an idea as a, as a substance. And therefore, if you like, this is part of the methodological uh, critique. So this methodological dissolution of the um, state, however, retains the state as a concept within the pure um, theory of law or a legal science of positive law because it becomes what is considered to be a heuristic concept. In other words, we have a normative hierarchy and we use the term state to identify, if you like, a certain uh, uh, area of, of norms within this hierarchy. And um, positive law for Kelsen is considered to be a normative order of uh, coercion, which exists autonomously and externally to individuals whose behaviour it guides or shapes. Therefore, uh, from this project, the dualism of state and law is overcome and the state, if you like, becomes part of um, the, let's say, normative hierarchy of positive law. Now, uh, this also affects the for Kelsen, the dualism between national and international law, because international law and national law are simply aspects of one uh, normative order. And this itself is part of Kelsen's project to insist upon the primacy of international law as part of a theory of legal monism. In other words, it rejects the, the distinction between, uh, let's say, domestic and international law in the sense of one being state law and one being international law for the reason that we've already gone into, that the state, if you like, is just a legal concept. OK, so the effect of the adoption of this Kelsenian methodology on the Rechstat, that is the notion of a rule of law, is that Kelsen's approach uh, essentially generalises this concept. So this is uh, provided with a fairly radical formulation in the pure theory of 1934. This is Kelsen's words. The attempt to legitimise the state as a Rechstat is exposed as a completely inappropriate, um, since every state must be a Rechstat if one understands by Rechstat a state which has a legal system. There can be no state that does not have or does not yet have a legal system, since every state is only a legal system. So, um, what I want to also say is that we can qualify this radicalism to an extent by um, proceeding a little bit backwards in Kelsen's work to the, the work of the later 1920s and early 1930s, um, where he formulates um, a theory of the Constitution. And um, it's with the notion of uh, the Constitution, and in particular a constitutional court, that we can argue that Kelsen's, let's say, radicalism of the pure theory, you can, you can qualify that. Why? Um, because, uh, in particular, in an article in the later 1920s, uh, Kelsen uh, uses a notion of constitutional justice. Now, this is to be understood as the capacity of a constitutional court, as an integral part of a constitution, to regulate the phenomenon of, of unconstitutional law. Uh, now, uh, this itself, uh, for Kelsen, is connected to in particular, the constitution of a democratic republic. Because for Kelsen, and this is from this article of the later 1920s, which hopefully will make this, this connection clear, he's talking about the, this con notion of constitutional justice and the operation of a constitutional court. It is an effective means of protection of the minority against the encroachments of the majority. If one considers the essence of democracy, not in the omnipotence of the majority, but in the constant compromise between the groups represented in Parliament by the majority and the minority, and consequently in social peace, constitutional justice appears as the particular or particularly propitious means to realise this idea. The simple threat of recourse to the constitutional tribunal can be, in the hands of the minority, a correct instrument to prevent the majority from violating unconstitutionally its juridically protected interests 
and to oppose itself through this in the final analysis to the dictatorship of the majority, which is no less dangerous for peace than that of the minority. So this uh, um, Kelsenian approach, like if we combine the pure theory and um, this earlier work on the Constitution, has an effect on Kelsen's theory of rights. Now this, uh, too, is shaped by Kelsen's preceding critique of natural law, uh, where he considers that natural law has an inherent uh, contradiction. And this inherent contradiction essentially rests on the fact that any invariant foundation requires human action for its implementation. And therefore necessarily, not only do you end up with norms of positive law, but if you like, the invariant foundation is, is, is realized selectively because of the, if you like, the differences in, in human character and action. Now, the pure theory proceeds beyond this critique, essentially to dissolve a notion of a uh, subjective right. In other words, for Kelsen, um, the pure theory proceeds to demonstrate that subjective right, if you like, the opposition between subjective right and objective law is again to be dissolved that subjective right is simply part of uh, objective law. Now, the, the purpose of doing this, essentially, is again to do with a, a legal theory or legal science of um, positive law. Why? Uh, because Kelsen wishes to reconfigure the understanding of the uh, legal person. So, in other words, if you like, in a similar way to the state, the legal person also becomes a heuristic concept. The legal person describes a complex of norms at a different level, a lower level than the state. So, in other words, we don't, give, we don't say that the legal person is prior to law. The legal person essentially is a concept which you use to describe a certain complex of norms which, which one can attribute, if you like, to this point within the hierarchy of the um, normative order of positive law. So, for Kelson, the effect of this overall reconceptualization of rights is the following. Legal connections between human beings more precisely between material facts of human behavior, which are linked together by, that is, as the content of the legal norm. The legal relation is the connection of two material facts, one of which consists in human behavior established as a legal obligation, and the other in human behavior established as a legal right. In understanding so-called law in the subjective sense, simply as a particular shaping or personification of the objective law, the pure theory renders ineffectual a subjectivist attitude toward the law, the attitude of so-called law in the subjective sense. So now we pass on to um, Weber, okay? Contrast here, because Weber's critique of this uh, preceding German language tradition is more indirect and develops um, incrementally. So if we begin with um, Weber's concept of the state, and here I follow um, the work of Hubert Treiber, who suggests that we start with paragraph 17, part one of Economy and Society, which I'll read out. A political institution, sorry, a political institutional organizational enterprise will be called a state to the extent that its administrative staff can exercise a monopoly of legitimate physical force in the execution of its orders. This condensed definition uh, is also to be understood as shaped by a wider interpretative methodology, which in more, let's say, contemporary language would be called methodological individualism or action theoretic uh, sociology. And this essentially orientates the underlying approach in this part of economy and society, whereby the concept of a state is attributed to the combined or collective effect of reciprocal individual social action. 
Now, this in turn leads us to a number of uh, linked uh, uh, Weberian concepts, which uh, essentially uh, uh, require us to identify this notion of Anstalt as the central Weberian term um, for a state. And for Weber, the state as an organization, as an Anstalt, is distinguished by an administrative staff implementing a statutory order in which membership is compulsory. And this, for Weber, represents the sociological preconditions of the formation of a state. So we can argue that this notion of Anstalt is the point of connection between Weber and this preceding German language tradition of a Staatswissenschaft, because essentially it takes, but from a sociological point of view, the preceding definition of a, of a constitutional monarchy. And essentially um, what it does is, it, it, this Weberian reinterpretation, it expresses the socio-historical transformation in the use of force, in which the monopoly of force and the capacity to enact statutes demarcates the modern state as the use of legitimate force. And it's also equally an expression of legal rationalization. Now, here for Weber, it is rule through law in the sense, in the sense of the enactment of maxims for the orientation of human action underpinned by the capacity for their enforcement, which is, if you like, Weber's notion of what you might call a Rechstadt. Now, the effect of this understanding is particularly evident if you turn to one of La Weber's last works, which is to do with his um, analysis of the Reich president of the Weimar Republic, where we have this notion of plebiscitarian um, Reich president, in other words, this, this directly elected personification um, of authority, which uh, represents a distinct uh, 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 kind of mode and, and locus of legal authority to dissolve parliament and to authorise referendums. So in other words, if you like, the, the, the dissolution, the Weberian dissolution of a substantive notion of Rechstadt is, is the counterpart of this, if you like, thematization of the figure of the Reich president. Now, a uh, Weberian con conception of rights um, now, while there is undoubtedly a Weberian connection um, with Jelinek, uh, from the very sort of uh, concrete biographical sense of Weber delivering the funeral oration um, for Jelinek's um, a funeral in 1911, um, we can't trace a direct relationship between this book by Jelinek in 1895 and Weber's uh, position. Um, Weber's position rather um, finds expression uh, uh, in other texts um, which we can say, uh, for example, are those dealing with the Russian revolutions of 1905 and 1917 and within a broader framework, part two of economy and society, which is conventionally called um, sociology of law. Now, um, Weber's sociological approach in contrast to Kelton, retains this dualism of subjective rights and objective law, but provides this with a sociological reinterpretation. And this is particularly apparent in Weber's response to the free law movement, in which Weber insists upon the retention of formalism of general legal norms, and the resistance to or alteration of these general norms to actively intervene and respond to social and economic uh, conditions. Therefore, as Hubert Treiber concludes in his recent work, Reading Max Weber's Sociology of Law, I'm quoting from him, it is possible to connect the trend towards rematerialization with Weber's fundamental belief that modernization and rationalization also produce wholly negative side effects. So to conclude uh, from this presentation of um, Kelsen and Weber's approach to the state and rights, we can say that um, they 
despite their critical engagement with the preceding tradition, continue to recognise the problematic character of the state. In place of the Nietzschean denunciation of the state, in thus spoke Zarathustra, there is a concerted attempt to undertake a methodological comprehension and regulation of the state's importance and power. And this is accompanied by an equally candid presentation within their respective methodological positions of the essential fragility of political organisation maintained by a legal framework composed of norms of positive law. Now, it's this distinctive combination of methodological regulation and fragility against which post-World War II juridico-political thought has sought to define itself. And in particular, there has been a sustained reconsideration of the continued pertinence of the dualism between values, which are inherently subjective, and validity. In other words, a methodological operation to establish a, a point or position of objectivity beyond all subjective value, from which both Kelsen and Weber uh, commence. Now, this reconsideration has led to the reopening of the question of the relationship between morality and law, the existence and justification of fundamental or basic rights and freedoms, and uh, the reconception of the character and purpose of a constitution and the notion of the Rechstadt or rule of law. And um, that's it. <laughs>